Hello and welcome to the Everything is Black and White podcast. I'm Andrew Musgrove and today we're bringing you a slightly different version of the Monday show because Aaron is away on holiday and it's my uh, little girl's first birthday today so we're off celebrating that but we wanted to bring you some uh, content as we always do and we're going to bring you another episode of introducing Newcastle's latest signing and it is the Nottingham Forest goalkeeper. I would have a go pronouncing his name but as you guys, guys know I'm a little bit bad at pronouncing uh, name. So I've got a guest here who hopefully has said his name a few more times than I have, although I get the impression not in a positive light. It is Max Hayes, the uh, host of the Garibaldi Red podcast. That's the Nottingham Forest show for our sister site, Not Michelle Live. You might remember Max being on the podcast a few times last season. Max, welcome back. You well? Yes, very well. Thanks for having us. Um, and yeah, often Forest fans re- refer to Vlakadimos uh, as Oddy. That was his nickname. Steve Cooper gave him almost that nickname, Oddi Vlakadimos, instead of the first. I actually find the first name harder to pronounce than his last name. And, and when he did sign for Forest, it was an absolute, it took forever to try and learn how to pronounce his name. I think many, many uh, people and just not your fans, but your broadcasters were struggling mm-hmm. to pronounce it on even the BBC and, 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 and places like that. Well, now you've said it, it doesn't seem that hard to say. Blackademos, I can say yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. What I was afraid of. Um, but we might uh, resort to calling them Oli later in the show. Uh, the reaction to this signing has been far from uh, positive from Newcastle United fans. And there has been some glee from Nottingham Forest fans who can't quite believe that it looks like they maybe even made a little bit of a profit on uh, this goalkeeper after such a disastrous first year at the City ground. I mean, he can't be as bad as some of the Forest fans are saying, right? Um, no, and he probably can't, actually. I will give him some credit. I mean, Vlakadimos came in as almost to replace Matt Turner. Forest have struggled with goalkeepers last season. It was a really, really big problem. Forget the points deduction. Forget the club statements. Forest went through a patch where, and I can remember it, we were talking on, talking on our podcast for a good two or three months about whether Matt Turner should be dropped and and Oddy came in to replace him or whether Forrest should go out and simply find another keeper. It ended up in the January transfer window with almost a last-minute deal for, for Matt Sells, who has proven really to steady the ship and, and no one's really talked about goalkeepers ever since. But that left Forrest with almost two reserve goalkeepers. And on paper, Matt Turner played for Arsenal in the Premier League. Flacca Demos played for Benfica. He featured in the Champions League a couple of times and, you know, in the top Europe leagues. This is a goalkeeper that on paper you'd think would be all right. Um, but when he kind of came in in the cup competitions, he didn't really steady the ship. I'd, I'd argue he, he was better than Matt Turner. Um, I'd have preferred to see him if Matt Sells wasn't signed as the number one, really, Vlacadimos. Um, But it ended up being kind of Matt Turner was the number one, Oddie was the backup. But then when Matt Sells came in, it kind of wiped it all out. And, and, and Vlacadimos didn't really even feature on the bench. I think he might have had a run out, if I can remember correctly, against Blackpool in the FA Cup. Uh, that was really it after Matt Sells signed in January. So it was a bit of a disastrous season. Um, but then you could argue that, hang on a minute, this guy hasn't really been given a chance. He was given a few months to settle in. I think people forget that footballers are sometimes only human. They're coming over from a different country. They're having to settle in uh, to England and, and, and certainly to the Premier League, which, as we all know, is, is such a hard league to settle into. Um and, you know, you could argue that he probably just needs maybe just a, a fair chance to have some first team football. I'm shocked that Newcastle have signed him. I think it's more of a PSR, uh, you know, almost kind of not loophole, if you like, but a PSR deal. Um, can I see him featuring for you, you know, as number one? Certainly not. Maybe as number two. I can imagine him featuring the featuring him in the cup competitions. Uh, but other than that, you know, he isn't he isn't everything that, that that some people have made out to be. Well, he's likely to be Newcastle Lights number two because we expect Martin Dubravka to leave when he returns from the Euros. But as last season proved, you know, often you need to rely on your number two. Uh, Nick Pope picking up an injury, which meant he missed most of uh, the second half of last season. It's a shoulder injury. There are questions about just how much you can fully recover from an injury like that, especially as a goalkeeper. And there are some fears that, you know, 
Oddie, as you guys call him, might be called upon sooner rather than later. If Newcastle United don't go out and sign um, another goalkeeper. I mean, it was meant to be James Trafford, but I can't see them now spending £20 million on another goalkeeper when they signed John Rudy and Vlaka Dimas. Um, it's quite interesting that you mentioned there when he was given the opportunity in, in the Cup games, and you've you've caveat, caveated that by saying, you know, it's not like he was given a consistent run of games, and I think that would always help. It's very hard to come in from the cold and expect to be, you know, you know, world class. But did he necessarily do anything wrong when he was given the opportunity to perform, or was it just he just didn't, you know, blow you away? Um, I, there was a few mistakes in there, and you know what? It's so hard to actually think back and remember some key ones. But I'm sure if you if you know if if I went and scrolled through the highlights now, there'd be a few. Um, I just don't think he was really. He didn't really command his box um, that well. I mean, Matt Turner made some howlers last season. I, I think he actually made a few against Newcastle when 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 Forrest played you earlier in the season. I can always remember him making a mistake, which just let Man United back into the game when when Forrest were 1-0 up. At, uh, it was around Christmas time and, and, you know, Matt Turner made this mistake. It let Rashford in and then there you go, Man, you were back and it's 1-1 and, it's and, and it was frustrating moments like that. You know, Vlakadimos wasn't obviously directly involved. However, when he came in, he just didn't really steady the ship. It, you, you never felt comfortable with him in goal. You never felt confident. Whereas Matt Sells came in and it was a completely different uh, story. Obviously, Forrest had, um, you know, Forrest have had many keepers in the past that you would look at and think, you know, yeah, they're the keeper. Uh, they command that back line, if you want, which is simply the job of a goalkeeper sometimes. And I think communication is key more than, than ever. And you just never thought we had that with Vlakadimos. So in terms of kind of standout errors, I actually can't think of any off the top of my head, which, you know, many Newcastle fans might see as a positive. However, I wouldn't go as far as saying that, um, as you said, Andrew, he blew us away. It really, really wasn't like that at all. It's funny, though, because if you had uh, done a similar show when you signed Matt Sells and you invited me on and said, OK, what are we getting? Yes, I would have said, well, OK, it was four or five years ago uh, since he played for Newcastle United. But he came in, Ralph Benitez signed him, and he was out the door pretty much as soon as his feet touched the ground. You know, he had a couple of games and he didn't impress for Newcastle United. He went away. He's turned himself into a very good goalkeeper. And sometimes... It's just maybe the right man at the wrong time. You go away, you mature, you get better, and you come back and you can prove yourself in the Premier League. And maybe, as you've alluded to, you know, all uh, Oddie needs is just time to settle. He's had this year now, things haven't gone to plan. But maybe, you know, if he's called upon, he's learned from his experiences, he can tap into, you know, winning the, the Premier League with Benfica, getting the quarterfinals of the Champions League and tap into that experience. And, you know, with the next couple of seasons, if he's needed, he can prove the doubt is wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And also you have to remember that arguably on paper, Newcastle's defensive line is much better than Forest. So sometimes people can be quick to, you know, um, throw blame on a goalkeeper, but it really could have been Forrest's defence or it really, you know, and, and that's where he may benefit in Newcastle having a stronger defensive line. So you hope that that's the case. Uh, the issue I think that, that that Newcastle might have is simply being able to settle him in. Uh, and as you talked about, it can be right player, kind of wrong time. Um, and often I think that was the case with Forrest. And let's not forget, Forrest have signed a, a stupid amount of players. So, for somebody to come in and, and make an impact in the dressing room and actually be able to settle in around 30 players, the psych, you know, the psychological impact and the mental impact of that must be really difficult as a professional footballer. So it hasn't been easy for him. It's hard to kind of almost give a definitive answer of whether he'll do well. You know, I'd like to see him do well at Newcastle. And he and he certainly might. It'd probably be the most forest thing for him to, you know, be absolutely brilliant for Newcastle and you to be heaping praise. And, and, and that's what it can be like sometimes with footballers. And, and as you mentioned there, Matt Sells, you know, the signing didn't blow Forest fans away, but he's certainly come in, done a great job. And, and people would argue almost been, um, you know, been a bit of an underdog for player of the season, if you like, last season. Wow, that's quite the statement. And I guess with the, what you've just said there, I'd like to do you know, how you would hope to see him do well. I think a lot of fans, when, you know, Matt Sells was tipped to sign the Forest, it was a bit like, oh, what's going on here? You know, he's not that good. But also there was a bit of want to see him do well. And it's good to hear that he that he has done. And um, when Lavlagadimos was signed from uh, ben, Benfica, was he signed as a number one? Or did he come in to offer competition to, was it was Turner at the club at that point? I'm just wondering what in what circumstances did he arrive at Forest? 
um, I think, if, if, if I can remember correctly, and I think I'm right, that Matt Turner was already there, but Matt Turner had only been there a short while. So I think he came in almost as a bit of a number two, but then he soon, you know, almost got given a chance to be number one. Steve Cooper found it really difficult because, you know, before he got sacked, there was calls left, right and centre, not just to change the formation, change the way he was playing, but to also change keepers every game. And and, and that certainly doesn't help a side. You need a keeper, you know, you almost literally start from the back and and Forrest didn't have that that strong option. So I think he came in to challenge Matt Turner. Um, and whenever he did come in to replace Matt Turner, again, he didn't blow anybody away. Um, but I think he was certainly signed as a number two, but then possibly with the option as a number one, whereas where Forrest signed Matt Sells, it was simply, we're desperate, we need a new keeper. We've tried these two, it's failing. You know, Sells was the only option. Um, whereas Vlakadimos, it was more of a number two. But, you know, it's been disappointing to see how it has panned out. Forest fans Forest fans would have loved to have had just Matt Turner and 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 you know Oddie as as the number one and two and, and not be in this position right now. And and that's what's got Forest into the PSR mess in the past is is signing too many players and and just to say that we had, I think it was four or five goalkeepers on the books until a few weeks ago. When Forest, re- you know, um, announced their release list, it, it was just a bit of a disaster, really. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about whether this was Newcastle uh, and Forest scratching each other's backs. Obviously, Elliot Anderson went uh, to the City Ground. I'll ask you about him at the end of the show. Um, but if you look back at the history of of Newcastle search for goalkeepers, obviously they signed Nick Pope eventually, but Blackademos was strongly linked to a move to St. James's Park, Newcastle United scouted him, they liked him, and this interest goes back to December 2021, so he could have ended up being one of the first signings of the new era, so they've clearly done their homework, and it's quite interesting, because when Newcastle United get a target in their heads, and they've looked at someone, they've scouted them, they've got a portal, and they don't really deviate, you know, they might not get him at the first time of asking him, but they don't tend to scratch him off the list, you know, they might go back in from later on, we've seen it with the chase for Sam Botman and others, so I, I don't necessarily think this is a, 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 a move that is wholly, you know, we scratch your back, you scratch our back. I think there's a genuine likeness for this goalkeeper and a genuine hope that they've signed someone who, okay, didn't have the best of starts in the Premier League, but can come into his own if called upon, which can only be a, a positive for him that he's, you know, he's got the backing of, of Eddie Howe and, and the, the scouting staff. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's a good point. And I actually read that, I think, the other day that obviously Newcastle were linked back with him a few years ago. And and I'm sure Forrest did their homework on him. And, you know, some players you can scout for forever. And, you know, Forrest, you know, I, I mean, you look at somebody like Morgan Gibbs-White and and people massively criticised Forrest when we signed him for 40 million and, and kind of broke transfer record fees to sign him. And he was on a big wage for the first time that the club had got back to the Premier League in 23 years. And just look how he's turned out. And and he's probably worth double that now, really, if he was to go. So, you know, there is that almost... Sometimes in football, when you... You know, people are quick to criticise certain deals and then they can be proved to be the best ones. And, you know, as you mentioned there, Elliot Anderson, the 35 million... People might think that that's a lot of money, but if he turns out and he's a huge player and Forrest sell him in two, three years' time for 85, 90 million and he's made such a big impact for the club, then it's a positive move all round. And and that's what Forrest and also Newcastle, I'm sure, will be looking at doing this summer. You know, recruitment teams are, are busy. This is their busiest period now in 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 these windows. And and it's ultimately trying to find young talent or or at least existing talent out there that they could possibly make a profit on because we all know... PSR, we all know financial rules now that come into football. You have to, you know, be seen to be selling those players and and ultimately making a profit. Um, and it is interesting. Vlakadimos has all this experience on paper. If you laid him out on paper compared to probably Matt Sells right now, you'd argue that Vlakadimos is a better keeper on paper. It's just when he was at Forest, you know, being totally honest, didn't perform, didn't give us really any faith. No, that's probably what not what Newcastle fans want to hear. Hope he does well. Hope he turns it around. Um, but yeah, just just was a disappointing move, really. No, you're correct. When you look at him on paper, if you strip away the name and you strip away the last year in in, in the Premier League, and you just put down what he's achieved, his international caps, more than 150 games for Benfica, reaching the quarterfinals of the Champions League, winning two league titles, and you say, okay, would you like this goalkeeper to sign for your club? 
they would probably stat on your hands off because you just look at his stats. But granted, you've seen him over the last year. But I do wonder, as you've mentioned, how much of it is down to being chucked in when you're not getting that consistent run of games. And look, he all being well in Newcastle United, he won't get a consistent run of games because Nick Pope will have recovered from that shoulder injury. He's a top-class goalkeeper as Nick Pope. Um, you know, One of the reasons that Newcastle didn't qualify for Europe this season was because they didn't have Nick Pope. Martin Dubravka, with all due respect, is nowhere near the level of Nick Pope. So if, if all goes well for Newcastle United, uh, Black Demos will be number two and maybe appears in cup games um, but won't be needed in the, the, the Premier League. I just want to read um, a, a quote from Eddie Howe who said... Uh, he's a very experienced at elite European international level and he joins a strong group of senior goalkeepers. The strength and depth is valuable. I mean, we go into the new season with strong competition in a key area. So I think that kind of alludes to what Newcastle United are building here. I don't think they've signed like the Moss as you know, a, a, a true rival to Nick Pope. Of course, you always want competition in every area of the pitch because that makes you better. It strips out complacency. Mm-hmm. But... I think the fact that he how there is pointing to building squad depth, signing John Rudy as well, keeping Mark Gillespie on for an extra year. It's, I think that's what it's about. It's just making sure you've got cover, you know, three or four goalkeepers should the worst happen. But I don't think he's going to be uh, number one at all. Can you give me any positives? Because so far it's been a little bit doom and gloom. Can you give me? Any? Um, the positive is he, he he looks good on paper and he might do a job and he played for and he, and he played for a top you know europe side in in, in benfica um i'm trying to think of other positives uh, steve cooper played uh, praised him quite a bit actually you know he he came under criticism and not that cooper was ever a manager to come out and, and, and openly criticize players but he wouldn't shy away from difficult questions. And I can actually remember in one press conference that Cooper did, um, he nicknamed him Oddy, which is where, you know, the nickname kind of started and said that um, he was a great guy to have around the dressing room. He's been a real credit to the club. Um, he's a family man. He's a really nice guy. And, uh, um, and that you know, he's kind of contributed lots to the football club. So if the head coach is, is, is saying that and somebody you know, uh, in Steve Cooper's position is saying that, then it's, um, then it's a positive. What I think is interesting, though, and sorry to go back to being a bit doom and gloom, is that Nuno Espirito Santo obviously, you know, was a goalkeeper around Portugal, knows of Benfica, will have certainly watched, seen and possibly scouted in the past Blackademos, and he didn't even give him that much of a chance, obviously, before he went. And and Nuno came in at, at kind of the wrong time, and I think it was just before, yeah, it was just around that kind of January time anyway. So, you know, there was never... There was never a chance for him to play. So there you go. It could have been a different scenario if, if, if you know, he'd arrive when, if Nuno was manager, let's say, um, you know, last summer, rather than it be Cooper. And, and maybe Cooper did have his favourite in Matt Turner. He didn't give him much of a chance. So the positives, he looks good on paper. He's been praised by people. He's never been openly criticised by the manager or, or players or, or certainly people at Forest. Um, and he seems like a good guy to have around the dressing room. You know, but that that's all taken away really at the end of the day because professional footballer performs on the pitch. So let's just see it. You know, it, it, it's a really difficult one because actually a lot of Forest fans don't don't know much about him. And you know, and I obviously do the podcast week in week out. So you know, you talk to people and and you obviously get almost um, knowledge on these players as as you will do, Andrew. But it was a bit of a weird one with Vlakadimos. Um, you know, he came in. I didn't really know much about him. It took me a couple of months to know how to pronounce his name. And really now I'm still in a position where going, well, he's from Benfica. He's a goalkeeper. You know, he's played in the Champions League. That's all I've got for you, really. Genuinely, that is all I've got for you. Mm, well, <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see because I, I wonder whether him leaving Benfica when he's played nearly every single game for the best part of four or five years, coming to Forest kind of maybe as a number two, not finding out that he's, he's number one. That That's going to be difficult to handle. He's come to Newcastle United where it's pretty much the same deal. You're not going to be number one. And that's a real test of character to go from playing week in, week out to not. Um, did he kick up a fuss at Forest? Was there any talk about bad character? Or did he just kind of get on and, and just, you know, get, get his head down in training? Or is it just, as you say, you know, we don't really know that much. Yeah, it, it's a bit of an interesting one. Um, from what I can remember knowing and, and, and seeing, 
he certainly didn't kick off. Uh, I know that there was a bit of you know there was a bit of tur- turmoil really inside the club about the goalkeeper situation. Um, it was a big issue before we even came on to points deductions, club statements, VAR, all of that that, that Forest faced. It was such a, a mad season last season, you know, to be and to be covering all of that was 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 just nuts. Um, and the goalkeeper situation added to that. It, it was a real, um, you know, it, it, it was a real turbulent time for for the coach, for for the ownership to discuss, to decide whether we should go out and get another keeper. I mean, I can remember we did podcast after podcast talking about whether Forrest should sign a goalkeeper and and or we should stick with with Matt Turner and Oddie. Many people disagreed. The fan base was almost split 50-50. And then it was all sorted at the end of January and everyone kind of forgot what had happened and, and ultimately forgot that Vlakadimos was even at the club. Which is quite sad when you think about it. This is a, you know, and as you mentioned, he's playing first team football at Benfica. He's then come over, he's then settling into to a new city, and he's not getting first team football. He's not getting that opportunity to to shine through, um, and certainly that does have an impact. So you'd hope that maybe at Newcastle under Eddie Howe, who who was obviously complimentary, you know, you read out that kind of quote from him um, a couple of minutes ago. So. Let's hope he does that. Um, but for sure, he don't think he ever kicked up a fuss. I know that Matt Turner had a few more kind of slight problems around Forrest and and wasn't happy with the way things were going. But but Vlakadimos never um, never really seemed to cause any issues off the pitch. Well, that's good to hear. I'm going to read you uh, a couple of uh, tweets that I've I've got. I did ask uh, listeners and viewers to get in touch with their thoughts on the signing of Vlakadimos and any questions for you, Max. Uh, Rob says. Uh, to him, it seems like Newcastle have used the PSR wrangles to get in a body cheaply and save the money that they were to spend on Trafford to spend elsewhere. It does leave me a little worried if anything happens to Pope, if he will be good enough. And then we've got Daniel, who is definitely walking up on the wrong side of bed, I will say, this morning. Um, he used an expletive to describe the signing, which I won't repeat because we are a little family show. Uh, but he says, when are we buying players? Uh, we need the money spent. We've lost two very good players, one obviously being Elliot Anderson. Um, he says, where are the signings? Proper players, not uh, John Rooney, not Lloyd Kelly, and not this chap. So he's not happy with Newcastle. United start to the window. And John says uh, to you, Max, we saw how good this goalkeeper was at Benfica. Why didn't it work out for him at Forest? I know you've covered it uh, kind of, you know, in the last 20 minutes or so, but just just go over it again slightly and offer anything new that you can to John there to, to why it didn't work out at Forest. Uh, you know, I'd say it didn't work out because he was a player that came in, as mentioned, from a different country to settle in and he wasn't playing first team football. And also Forest were going through such a turbulent time at that moment. There was talks of points deductions. There was talks of Steve Cooper lo- leaving and Nuno coming in. You had almost a mix of players last season, a few that were part of the promotion winning season, a few that were part of the season after that survived under Steve Cooper was ultimately a great season for Forrest back in the Premier League. And then all of a sudden you had all these other players thrown into the mix that were in the second season. You know, Forrest were near the bottom of the table still, probably, you know, worse off where we'd expected. You forget how hard the Premier League is. A lot of people around the club expected Forrest to, to be mid-table last season, you know, forget the points deduction for a minute, but expecting to be almost pushing up the league and, and improving. And it wasn't like that. So I think it didn't work because he came in during a turbulent time. Um, he wasn't probably given a fair chance. And ultimately, Forrest had a mess defensively. Forrest defensively were poor. You forget that Murillo didn't come in until later on in the season. You know, Omar Baladelli wasn't given a chance. The young lad from Norwich until Nuno came in. So, Forest back line was again very, very. I can, you know, I can remember last season. Forest never really had a problem, especially at the start, scoring goals and attacking, but defending and and certainly, you know, we, we I think we talked about it before, Andrew, when we um when we did the Forest Newcastle preview about Forest weakness being set pieces and and it certainly didn't help all the pressure amongst that them with a the new keeper coming in. So it didn't work out because it was a turbulent time. You can blame some of that on him because he didn't really perform. He didn't really you know, um, do what, what you know, a professional goalkeeper is su- supposed to do and, and Forest fans would have liked to have seen. But maybe just, you know, right player, wrong time and we'll see how he does at Newcastle. I wouldn't give up all faith on him yet, though. If, if you got Matt Turner, I'd be I'd be a lot more worried for you. Um, I think, uh, I think Oddie and I think, I think he might do a job. So just keep the faith, I'd say. <laughs> there we go. We'll take that. I just want to finish off by asking you about some of players at Forest. We'll start 
about Ellie Anderson. Um, I was saying to you off air that I'm I'm good that he's gone. I think £35 million could prove to be an absolute bargain for Forrest because I've seen enough to really think he's going to be a, a top, top player. I said earlier in the week that I think he'll be a top six player and he'll be an England and national. I didn't go down too well with everybody, but I stand by that point. I've seen enough to suggest he's going to be very, very, very good. Um, what's the the general consensus on the sign of, of Anderson. There's a lot to talk about the the price tag, but as I think, as I've said there, I think it's 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 a fair price. If anything, it might prove to be um a little bit uh too cheap for Newcastle in the years to come. But what is the the consensus on Anderson? I think Forest fans are more happy than Newcastle fans as part of this deal. Let's not forget when Forest signed Chris Wood, we were you know we were laughed at really from from Newcastle fans and and said oh well you know we've kind of had your pants down there but 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 Forest um Forest really have have almost proved Newcastle fans wrong with Chris Wood not really towards the end of last season but certainly on Boxing Day you know I, I hate to remind you Andrew but but when he just turned up and and he was completely on fire and and I suppose Forest fans hope the same for Elliot Anderson thirty five million pounds is a lot I think I think you know the price tag is. I wouldn't use the word extortionate, but it's maybe silly. However, there's many reports that it isn't 35 million up front. Uh, you know, it's a much smaller fee with add-ons over the next, you know, few months uh, that will rise. So hopefully it is that because when Forrest are in a bit of a PSR crisis to spend 35 million on a player just just really, really shocked, um, shocked the fan base. But as you said, he seems like he can... He can certainly do a job. And if you're, you know, I've seen kind of nothing but praise for him. I mean, kind of almost throwing this one back at you as well, Andrew. I mean, what was he? I always think it must be difficult for, a, you know, because he came really from Newcastle through the ranks. It must be difficult for a player to leave his boyhood club. And then also he had a bit of an injury last season. So, you know, Forest fans don't really know much about him. But there's that hope there that it's kind of that young, hungry talent, which is what we're trying to go for this summer with recruitment. Yeah, look, there's a lot of what-if moments from my point of view for Newcastle last season. We suffered so much with injuries. But one of the big regrets is that Elliot Anderson picked up an injury which ruled him out for about four or five months. When, if he'd been fit, he would have gone into that midfield. Lewis Miley, the 17-year-old, was the man who had to go in. The man, the boy who had to go in and performed very well. But make no mistake about it, had Anderson not picked up an injury as well, he would have been the man there. And he would have taken his opportunity. He would have shone. And when he finally did come back, he did very well. He really impressed. I think this is the big, biggest frustration. He really impressed pre-season last summer. Lots of expectation that he would actually be one of the, the starters um, at the start of the season. He wasn't. Then he picked up the injury. When he did come back towards the end of last season, you know, he showed exactly why Eddie Howe is a massive fan of him and saw him as a big part of the future. It was just one of those where Newcastle United needed to make profit more than anything else and when you're an academy graduate and you can you know put 35 million pounds on on the book and it's pure profit it's one of those where you know reluctantly it has to be done and i think anderson understood as well the severity of it um that newcastle united needed him to go and it was him doing newcastle united a favor he didn't want to leave i don't think but he understood when you cast know, were a little bit desperate and also i think from a Forest point of view, and we'll maybe talk about this for more in depth for, for you guys. If you're a Forest fan, you've stumbled across it. But for the, the, the opportunity first team football, because with everyone back for Newcastle, Anderson was probably going to be fifth, sixth choice, maybe not guaranteed to start. I think he would have been within a shout of, of, of having a you know a chance to prove himself. But if you were to ask me now, with everyone back fit, what Eddie Howe would do. Anderson wouldn't be starting and I think given the opportunity to play more first team minutes in the Premier League for a team like Forest, great history, great club as a young lad you've got to try and take every opportunity you can so it makes sense for him, Newcastle get the money he leaves Newcastle United with everyone patting him on the back saying good luck with the future, come back when you've you've made it, I'm sure well I hope there might be a buyback clause in it as well but look, absolutely fantastic player to be and uh, I'm really excited to see how it goes uh, for him I want to ask you as well, just briefly, about two of Forest players. Morgan Gibbs White is one of the dream signings that Newcastle United fans would love to see this summer. I did enjoy, I don't know if you saw it, Max, but when um, 
when Anderson signed and then there was reports that a, a Forest player would be coming the opposite way, the yeah. amount of people on social media were like, Morgan Gibbs White. And I just text my colleague, colleague saying, I'd love to have whatever they've had on their cornflakes this morning because that's never happening in a month of Sundays. It turned out to be uh, this goalkeeper. But what <laughs> player he is. Is he, is he any chance he's going to move from Forest this summer? Uh, no, I'd actually expect that Murillo will most likely go. If Forrest have got to basically break, uh, the, well, no, Forrest have got to comply with PSR, certainly not break it because we don't want another points deduction. Um, <laughs> you know, that would be more uh, more light on, on Forrest after such a crazy season uh, last year. I think Murillo is more likely to go. Um, just such a a huge player that's come in for Forrest, but he's young and he's got, I mean, I think he'll be at Real Madrid in, in 10 years. He honestly is that good. I've, I've never seen a player almost control the defence. And, and in a poor season for Forrest um, on the pitch and a poor defensive line at times, uh, Murillo would always be there, right place, right time to rescue Forrest. Morgan Gibbs-White, on the other hand, Forrest have kind of built the team around Morgan. Um, without him, it's a it's a nightmare, to say the least. You know, if, if Morgan gets injured for six months, then... Forrest will be losing points left, right and centre. So Morgan Gibbs-White controls the side. You almost feel like he's one of your own and he's come from the academy. He gets the city. He gets the club. There was you know, a brilliant moment just before Forrest beat Fulham 3-0 where he probably had one of his best standout performances ever in a Forrest shirt. There was a lovely um, kind of banner, uh, Tifo from uh, Forza Garibaldi, the Forrest fan group of Morgan Gibbs-White with you know his hands in his ears kind of shutting out the noise. And it was brilliant. And, you know, moments like that between him and the fan base have, I think, just encouraged him to keep performing. And I think if Forrest were to lose one player out of the two, we'd definitely take, you know, let Murillo go. If we lost Morgan Gibbs-White, it would be it would be a disaster, in, in my opinion. But maybe that's where the likes of Forrest looking at somebody like Elliot Anderson, that they can, you know, improve in the next few years. That's naturally going to improve as, as, as a as a top class talent, hopefully, as you've been saying, Andrew, then that's where he slots into that position if Morgan does eventually go. It did make me laugh when there was all the rumours of which players, you know, potentially would move. We'd have been disappointed to see Alanga go. You know, if I was doing this podcast now talking about Anthony Alanga and and you know, talking to him about um, talking to you about what you're going to get from him, I'd, I'd be leaping praise on him. Um, the same with Callum Hudson and Doyle, and obviously the same with Morgan Gibbs White. So we're Forest fans were relieved that it that it wasn't somebody as key as that. Um, you know, whether Morgan will be linked with you throughout the summer, who knows? Uh, but I just can't I can't see him going. I think Murillo is more likely to leave. Well, our listeners and viewers know that I'm a massive fan of Anthony Lang, and I wouldn't rule that deal coming back up in the next few weeks. Uh, Newcastle and I are very interested in him. And I think that's a deal that could could definitely be done. I think it would be reluctantly done by Forrest, but you could probably double the money I think that you paid by United for him. I just, I just think he's absolutely brilliant. He could come in and team up with his Swedish teammate, Alexander Izak, as well, and provide the, the crosses that have been lacking somewhat um, over on that right wing, can play on the left as well. Big, big fan of him. I, I really do hope you are back on this podcast <laughs> next month. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> about Alanga, um, I'm, I, I, I've got, a, I've got a, a little feeling that one um, could happen, and uh, that would be my um, dream sign. And people laugh at me when I say that because you know, Newcastle United people think they've got all the money in the world. They haven't. The last two days of June proved that uh, Alanga for me would be a massive upgrade on Miguel Almiron. So hopefully, from my point of view, Max, that one uh, can happen. Well, thank you very much for popping on, and uh, not quite picking up the mood about uh, <laughs> yeah, at least I can pronounce his name with relative ease I don't know what I was afraid of so that's what I've got out of this podcast that his name is not as difficult to pronounce as I thought it was I'm not going to try with his first name though but I can say Vlakadimos until the his first name's quite easy actually uh, Odysseus Vlakadimos is the way I was calling it and l- nobody kind of criticised me for saying it that way so there you go there we go Odysseus Vlakadimos wonderful uh, exactly. hopefully when called upon, if called upon, he can prove the doubts is wrong. And this has been everything is black and white podcast. Thanks to Max for popping on and sharing the insight into Newcastle United's potential number two for the season to come. Give the video a thumbs up on YouTube if you are listening on the audio channel and leave us a rating and review. Head over to chroniclive.co.uk. Follow our live transfer blog with all the gossip, rumours, concrete stories in there. Thank you as always. And I'll see you guys very